So thank you. I'm happy to introduce you to Claire Moore Cantwell, uh, uh, who is going to give the second talk uh, of uh, today's uh, KEO International Christian University Linguistic Colloquium. Uh, Claire is assistant professor at UCLA, uh, and she received her PhD from University of Massachusetts Amherst in uh, 2016. Uh, for her research, Claire studies how exceptionful or prob probabilistic generalizations over linguistic objects are learned and how they are represented in the adult linguistic system. She's also interested in prosodic structure, both at the level of the word and of the sentence. Claire is particularly interested in the process of planning and implementing prosodic structure during sentence, prosodic, uh, sentence production. Today, uh, Claire will talk about learning a crazy rule, final vowels and stress in English. Without further ado, let's uh, give the stage to Claire. Uh, okay, hello everyone. Um, let me just share my screen here. Um, people can see it? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, so uh, thanks to uh, Shigeto and Sunghoon for this invitation. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you guys today about this uh, crazy rule um, in the English stress system um, and how learners might acquire it. Uh, the crazy rule is a probabilistic rule, so I guess that's how it fits into um, my research as Sunghoon just described it. Um, but uh, that's a little bit of a back seat. <laughs> that fact is going to take a little bit of a back seat today. Um, okay, so in general, um, phonological patterns across the world's languages tend to uh, be phonetically natural or structurally simple. Um, this can mean that they, uh, they make production or perception easier when people follow them, um, or they just tend to be simple to represent. So simple to represent would mean like not that many features, don't refer to like a lot of different positions in the word, things like that. Um, so there might be a lot of different kind of ways to understand this fact about phonology, but one sort of theoretical way um, is provided by optimality theory. Um, which kind of provides a handy way to account for the fact that phonological patterns tend to be certain ways and not others, I guess, um, which is universal constraints. Um, so with a universal constraint set, um, this means that learners are limited in the number of constraints that um, they can use uh, to represent their native language phonology. Um, sometimes this also means that they're limited in the particular configurations of those constraints. Um, so there might be like universal rankings of these constraints as well, or at least default rankings. Um, so today what I want to talk about is what happens in um, sort of optimality theoretic terms, or at least constraint-based terms, what happens when language learners are confronted with a pattern that is unnatural, um, that they really can't represent with um, these universal constraints. Uh, okay, so first of all, I just want to say that um, I'm completely going to leave aside, just going to totally skip over the question of what it means to be natural. Um, there is a really great paper here by Morton and Paper Pater that I've cited, um, which if you're interested in this topic, it's a good read, has lots of references. Um, this is a really important question, and in some ways I really shouldn't be skipping over it, but I am, um, mostly because the pattern that I'll talk about today is um, it's really hard to imagine how it could be a natural pattern. It's extremely unnatural kind of by any metric you look at, um, you look at it. So, okay, leaving that aside. <laughs> um, so what happens when learners are confronted with some kind of unnatural pattern in their language that they have to learn? Um, so there's two kind of um, options, I guess, that uh, have some evidence behind them. So the first one is that they just don't learn unnatural patterns. Um, so if there's an unnatural pattern in the lexicon of a language, it can even be really robust. Um, learners just won't incorporate it into their grammar. So they won't learn rules about it, they won't, won't learn constraints about it. You know, however you think the grammar is, they won't put it in their grammar. Um, so some evidence for that comes from um, this Becker et al. paper, which studied Turkish, um, and the Zhang et al. paper studied uh, the Taiwanese 
tone circle. Um, so that was a case actually that has quite a lot of evidence in the lexicon of the language, and yet people don't seem to uh, have a phonological representation of the entire system. They pick out certain pieces which are natural, um, but they leave the whole system. Uh, they don't learn the whole system. On the other hand, there's some evidence that learners do learn unnatural patterns, um, but maybe weakly, maybe not, um, not as well as they learn the natural ones. And so this evidence uh, comes from this classic paper by Hayes et al, um, which studied Hungarian vowel harmony and found both natural and unnatural patterns in there, um, and that people were learning both of them, but the natural ones better. <laughs> um, okay, so what I want to kind of talk about today is really if it's true that learners can sometimes learn unnatural patterns, unnatural phonological patterns, um, where do those constraints come from? Uh, so typically, um, people that study like probabilistic patterns, like the Hayes et al. paper did, um, these tend to crop up a lot, where there's sort of a pattern that doesn't look completely natural, but it's probabilistically active, meaning it's like people observe it some of the time. Um, it affects the probabilities that they give in WUG tests, um, but it doesn't really look supernatural. And in general, people tend to uh, just write kind of whatever constraint works and move on. Um, so I want to basically I want to tell you today about a, a pattern that I found that was really hard to write any constraint for at all. Um, so it made me really think about this a little bit um, harder. So anyway, uh, today I want to present to you an analysis and also some experimental evidence um, of a productive um, unnatural pattern from the English stress system. Uh, okay, so here is the pattern. Oops, here's the pattern. Um, so I'm calling it the final E generalization. So this is a summary. I will talk in more detail about this as the talk progresses. Um, but to summarize, the pattern is that words that end in the vowel E, all other vowels are different, so just the vowel E, um, like a recipe, prefer to take antepenultimate stress in English over other stress patterns. Uh, while words that end in other vowels, like schwa, exhibit no preference. Um, so there's something special about the vowel E when it comes at the end of a word that affects the stress pattern of the whole word. Um, so this is a pretty weird pattern. Um, I'll talk more later about like exactly what makes it weird. Um, but in spite of its unnaturalness, um, it is productive. So I have two hypotheses that I want to explore today. Um, the first one is that um, when learners are confronted with an unnatural pattern like this, um, they add constraints to their grammar by cloning existing constraints. Um, so, for example, uh, if you have a constraint that, uh, well, what we'll see today is an example of a constraint that um, is general for the whole language, but maybe you clone a second copy of it for just a subset of words, in this case, the final E words, E final words. Um, the second possibility is that learners create new what I'm calling parochial constraints, this is a term other people use as well, but um, what that means is just that they are, um, they don't fit with other, they don't look like other constraints. They're very sort of um, to the point. Um, in this case, the constraint will just be one that says, if a word ends in E, it should have antepenultimate stress. Um, so it's uh, very particular, very like pointed at the exact issue, not, um, kind of general about the whole language. Um, okay, so these need not follow structural parameters of existing constraints. Um, so the final E generalization can be analyzed under both of these hypotheses just fine, um, all by itself, um, but it turns out it interacts with another pattern in English stress, um, which is a lot more well known. So this is the Latin stress rule, um, which is basically a rule about um, syllable weight. So this interaction, once we look at the interaction between the final E generalization and the Latin stress rule um, in a WUG test, this will wind up supporting hypothesis too. So that's kind of where we're headed. Um, I'll be arguing for, you know, the learners don't do this thing that might, we might think of as simple, cloning existing constraints. They don't actually do that. And so they learn um, these par more parochial constraints. Okay, so here's a roadmap for the talk. Um, I'm gonna start by talking about just the facts of the English lexicon in some detail. Uh, so I'll get my data from the CMU Pronouncing Dictionary of English. Um, and I'll focus on longer words of English specifically here. So three or more syllables. So um, the reason this is important is that when I get started talking about syllable weight, um, there's effects of syllable weight that 
happen in like two syllable words, but not in three syllable words. So I'll be completely ignoring those. So if you're familiar with, um, with those patterns in English stress, uh, don't worry, I know about them. They don't affect what's going on here, but I'm just not gonna talk about them. Okay, so I'll focus on longer words um, and I'll look at the final E generalization as well as the Latin stress rule in the lexicon of English. Um, second, um, I'm gonna go through some um, first optimality theory analysis and then I'll switch rather quickly into uh, maximum entropy grammar or max ent grammar, uh, which is just a probabilistic uh, constraint-based model. It's based on OT, um, but instead of ranking, the constraints have weights and the weights will predict a probability distribution. Um, so this is more accurate um, kind of model when you're thinking about the English stress system because it is probabilistic in nature. Uh, there's exceptions to everything. So. Um, so I'll be presenting an analysis in this framework um, and comparing specifically the kind of constraint cloning idea versus the parochial constraint idea. Um, both of these are consistent with the lexicon, um, as we'll see. Um, there are crucial data that would distinguish them if they existed. So these crucial data are E final words with a heavy penultimate syllable. Um, there are a few in the lexicon of English, but they're extremely rare. Um, so they don't really provide learners enough evidence to say um, it has to be one type of constraint or the other. Uh, okay, so uh, finally, I will conclude with two experiments. Um, so the first one is uh, basically just testing whether this unnatural generalization is productive. Um, spoiler alert, it is, um, <laughs> but I want to show you the actual data about that. Um, and then the second experiment will look at the interaction between that finally generalization and the Latin stress rule um, and test in particular that crucial missing data. So those E final words with a heavy penult. Um, and we'll see that what participants actually do on those words that they don't really have in their lexicon when, you know, when I give them as bug words, what participants do is consistent with using parochial constraints and not consistent with using constraint cloning. Um, so that's kind of where we're headed. Okay, so um, first I want to start off with um, the uh, data from the CMU Pronouncing Dictionary. So um, these, what you see here is a graph um, <laughs> that basically just splits words up by their final vowel. Um, so I've got schwa, um, syllabic nasal, E, L, and R here. Um, these are not all the vowels of English, but these are all the vowels of English that are final and not stressed in substantial numbers. So there's you know, just a few ooh final words and so on, but I didn't include them in this graph because there were very few of them. Um, so what you can see here, uh, oh, also I should say they're split up by whether they take antepenultimate stress or penultimate stress. And remember, these are all words that are three syllables long or longer. Um, so what you can see is that the final vowel really matters for uh, where stress winds up being placed on the word. So schwa and syllabic nasal pattern roughly together. Um, I guess there's a little bit of a difference between them. Schwa is really close to 50-50. Uh, syllabic nasal is a little bit more towards the penult end, um, penultimate stress. Um, whereas E, L, and R seem to pattern together kind of in the opposite direction of preferring antepenultimate stress. Um, now, I haven't tested L and R in an experiment, so I can't really conclude too much about whether um, there might be a productive generalization <laughs> um, in speakers' minds <clears throat> about these as well. Um, the focus for this, uh, what I'll be talking about today, is the final E specifically. Um, <clears throat> so what you can see here is basically when a word ends in E, the vowel E, um, there is a 93% chance that it will take antepenultimate stress. So there's just a few words where it, um, just a few E final words that don't. So these are words like uh, canary, I have an example on the slide here, um, spaghetti, zucchini. Um, these basically constitute exceptions to the final E generalization. Okay, so that's the data sort of supporting that. Um, <clears throat> this generalization is unnatural. <laughs> um, it doesn't really look like other stress generalizations in the world's languages. Uh, so here's exactly how. Um, <clears throat> typically, stress patterns are influenced by two things, uh, the edges of the word and syllable weight. 
Um, so stress tends to be aligned to the right edge of the word or to the left. So we get languages with initial stress, with final stress, with penultimate stress, with pen initial stress. Um, so, you know, kind of being aligned either totally at an edge of the word or aligned with in some kind of specific relationship to the edge of the word. Um, syllable weight also tends, you know, matters a lot in a lot of languages. Um, and basically the way that works is that heavy syllables attract stress. So you get patterns like rightmost heavy or leftmost heavy. Um, so <clears throat> stress will find a heavy syllable in the word and, you know, that's a syllable that will get main stress. Um, what doesn't generally matter is segmental content. Um, the one exception is that sometimes it does matter in uh, terms of determining syllable weight. Um, but the final E generalization is not a case of that. So it involves a vowel quality affecting stress placement. Um, it's a specific vowel. It's not like vowel length or anything like that. It's just the quality, like E versus schwa or other vowels. Um, it doesn't do this via weight. So it's not a case of like E is attracting stress or avoiding stress because it's heavy or light or something. It's not that. Um, it's sort of mandating where stress goes you know, actually three syllables away in the word. Um, so it's pretty weird. It's not the kind of thing that we generally see um, in the stress typology in the world. Okay, so just to summarize, it's typologically atypical. Um, it is structurally complex. So uh, what I mean by that is it involves multiple positions. So there's a relationship between like the end of the word and the stress syllable, which is not at the end of the word. Um, it involves multiple features, so a prosodic feature stress and a segmental feature vowel quality. Um, it's not particularly phonetically motivated. I will say that this is a point that I have not fully explored. So if anyone can think of a phonetic motiva motivation for this generalization, I would love to hear it. Um, but I can't really think of anything about the E in the third syllable would necessarily affect like the perception of stress um, in the first two syllables of the word, so not even in the same syllable. Um, I don't think there's anything necessarily about antepenultimate stress that makes the final E easier to articulate or vice versa. Um, so given all this, um, I would argue that if it's productive, this pattern would require non-universal constraints. So just to drive that home, um, if I were to just say, okay, I've got a new constraint, I, I, found, a, I found a pattern, the final E generalization, um, I need to represent it with a new constraint um, and it's universal. So then whatever that constraint is, it's going to allow other patterns like this. It would predict more patterns like this in the typology than we actually see. Um, so it would predict that other languages should also exhibit, you know, relationships between particular vowel qualities and, like, you know, stress of other syllables in the word. And we don't really see that. Um, so especially once we get into the actual stress constraints, I think it'll be really clear that we don't want to um, create a new universal constraint to account for this generalization. Uh, okay, so now switching gears a little bit, I'm gonna talk about another um, aspect of the English stress system, which is um, weight sensitivity. So English stress follows, um, <coughs> excuse me, what's known as the Latin stress rule. The Latin stress rule is, unlike the final E generalization, pretty typologically, uh, typical, it, it, the exact same rule happens in other languages as well, notably Latin. Um, and it's basically a rule that says heavy penultimate syllables are stressed. Um, there's sort of a second clause to it, which um, the data that I've already shown you from uh, the CMU pronouncing dictionary kind of tell you it's not really the case, but um, the sort of second clause is otherwise antepenultimate syllables are stressed. Um, that doesn't tend to be the case. In fact, if the heavy, if the penult is light, we see variation. Um, in reality. But anyway, the, the rule is that heavy penals are stressed. Um, so what does it mean to be heavy in English? It's always an important question to ask. So I have this uh, chart at the bottom. Um, I've actually split the words of English up into three categories here in terms of whether their penultimate syllable is heavy. So I've got heavy syllables up here, which have a long vowel or have a coda consonant. Um, so words like exponent with a long vowel, um, galaxy, actually uh, does not have the penal stress, but it's clearly a heavy penal. Um, words like aroma and elixir follow the Latin stress rule, so their heavy penultimate syllable is stressed. Um, on the other end, these are, these are the two we're going to really care about today, on the other end is um, penultimate syllables that are definitely light. So this would be the penultimate syllable of settler, 
uh, radio, cinema, so these are um, syllables that neither have a long vowel nor a coda. Um, in the middle here uh, are what I'm calling ambiguous weight um, syllables. So these are syllables that if they are stressed, they are heavy, but if they are stressless, they are light. Um, so here's an example uh, from uh, an example with a liquid. So uh, if you think about the word, a word like faculty, um, that syllable, that penultimate syllable, kol, <laughs> is definitely light. It only has a consonant and a vowel in it. Doesn't have a long vowel. Doesn't have a coda. Um, but if you were to try to um, put the stress on this, you'd probably insert a vowel of some kind. So you might get something more like beholden. Um, where now there is a coda, so this does count as heavy. Um, and the same, same kind of thing is happening when um, the final syllable of the word, the word after the syllable in question, has um, a cluster. So it turns out in English when, um, as in the word digestive um, over here, uh, when a syllable is stressed, it can kind of like attract to it some segments from the following syllable, if necessary, um, to become heavy. So I'm going to basically ignore those today, but I do just want to kind of alert you that they do exist. Um, so a couple notes, I diverge a little bit from other accounts of weight in English and that I'm counting E and U along with all lax vowels, but E and U are the particular ones. I'm counting those as short. So you can see that a word like bikini for me has a light penal, not a heavy one. Um, this is a little bit more, uh, if you split things up this way, you get a cleaner split <laughs> in terms of behavior. Um, so that's why I did it this way. Um, also carpenter in these two papers, 2010 and 2016, showed that people don't really prefer to stress these vowels in a white test. So um, that's kind of extra evidence that this is the right call. Uh, okay, so um, searching the CMU dictionary now for these different types of syllables. So you can see um, heavy on the left here, ambiguous in the middle, and light on the right. Um, and what you can see is that the light syllables don't always take into the penultimate stress, but it's definitely their preference. Meanwhile, the heavy syllables over on the left um, basically always take penultimate stress. So we got 95%, 97%, um, these really high percentages. The ambiguous syllables are in the middle, um, which is kind of unsurprising. <clears throat> uh, okay, so now I want to talk a little bit about the interaction between this final E generalization and this um, Latin stress rule or penal heavy generalization, if you want to call it that. Um, so they both have, um, they're roughly equally strong in the lexicon, actually, numerically speaking. Um, so the final, oops, the final E generalization has a 93% observance, while the Latin stress rule has like a 95 to 97% observance. Um, so they're both quite, 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 quite strong. They don't have a lot of exceptions. Um, but the Latin stress rule, as I mentioned, is maybe more natural. Um, so it's an interesting question what happens with Final E heavy penal words. Um, does the final E make them have antipenultimate stress or does the heavy penal make them have penultimate stress? Um, so I have kind of this complicated graph here, but I want to draw your attention. So uh, on the left here, we have two kinds of heavy syllables. Now they're split up by vowel. This is a graph you've already seen before, so you can ignore it, but it's there for your uh, reference. Um, so on the left here, we have uh, schwa final, n final, and then e, l, and r final. And what I want you to just notice about this is there's really not a lot of e final words. Um, so this little tiny bar here and this little tiny bar here um, add up to a total of 16 words. Now, you will also notice that these just a few words that are e final, they do seem to trend towards the antipenultimate stress, but uh, there's only, I think, six words in this bar. So uh, it's not really a lot of evidence. Okay, so uh, moving on to analysis now. Um, so I wanna start by kind of uh, recapping previous analysis of analyses of English stress with constraints. Um, so these come from Peter 2000, Alcantara 1998. Um, I think this is kind of a consensus position on uh, the Latin stress rule, at least in English at this point. Um, so we got three constraints here. We got foot binarity. Um, this is maybe a little different than other types of foot binarity. Uh, well, there's a couple types of foot binarity, and this is the type it is. Um, it is a type of foot binarity that assigns a violation to every foot that is not binary, meaning it does not contain exactly two moras. So foot binarity allows uh, light, light feet and heavy feet. It does not allow light, heavy, 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 or a single light in a foot. Um, 
Next, we've got foot non-finality, which says assign a violation to a candidate whose final syllable is parsed into a foot. So foot non-finality wants the final syllable of the word to remain totally unparsed. Um, finally, we have a line right, which just wants feet to be as close as possible to the right edge of the word. Um, so as you can see in this tableau on the right, these three constraints are sufficient to predict weight sensitivity, um, in particular on the penultimate syllable. Um, so what we can see is that foot binarity, I've got foot binarity at the top here in terms of ranking, and then no ranking between non-finality and the line right is necessary. So foot, not, uh, foot binarity basically rules out a lot of the candidates. Um, oops. So we just get uh, as possibilities uh, this and a penultimate form for the all light words, and this penultimate form for the all light words. So this would be something like uh, cinema, something like vanilla. Um, this is another case where the uh, penultimate syllable is light, but there's distracting heavies around. So I just want to make sure I have an analysis that won't just stress any heavy. It will only stress the heavy when it's the penult. Um, so that's the case here. Uh, in this case, both this, this form, uh, candidate G and candidate J, are you know, totally possible. Um, but candidate J is ruled out by non-finality. Um, and then if we scroll down to the uh, uh, forms of the heavy penult, we'll see that if it's only the penultimate syllable that's heavy, uh, foot binarity alone is enough to rule anything else out. There's no other way to foot this word, a uh, word of this shape, uh, such that that would be legal according to foot binarity. Um, and then for this, the word with all heavies, uh, the penult still gets stressed um, because of non-finality uh, and because of a line rate. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, now I'm gonna switch to a probabilistic version of the same analysis. Um, okay, so uh, I'm using a probabilistic analysis for the rest of the talk for a couple of reasons. Well, for one main reason, which is that English stress is full of exceptions. Um, all these patterns are probabilistic, as you'll see when I tell you what people actually did on a web test, uh, people behave probabilistically as well. They don't just choose one pattern or the other for a given type of word. Um, so I'm not gonna really go through these equations too much. All you need to know is that there are weights on the constraints. Higher weight um, is equivalent to like a higher ranking. So a higher weight means the constraint is more important. So in this case, uh, non-finality is more important than a line right. Um, and the weights conspire together to create a harmony um, with the violations. So uh, you can kind of see like this form only violates a line right, so its harmony is just completely determined by the weight of a line right. Other forms have sums of the weights. Um, and then those harmonies translate into probabilities. Um, so what you can see here is basically a probabilistic version of what was on the last slide. Um, so forms of the light penult still prefer antimultimate stress. You can see it here. Um, you can see it here. And then forms with the heavy penult still prefer penultimate stress. So you can see that here um, and here. So this is a bit of a weaker preference, but it's still um, the most likely form. Okay, so moving on to the final vowel. Um, I discussed at the beginning of the talk two hypotheses. So um, learners add constraints to their grammars by cloning existing constraints, or learners add constraints to their grammars by creating new parochial constraints, which don't need to follow structural parameters of existing constraints. Uh, okay, so here are the actual constraints I'm going to use for those two hypotheses. So for hypothesis one, um, I will use non-finality E. <laughs> okay, so this is a cloned version of non-finality um, that is exactly the same as non-finality, except for that it only applies to E final words. So it goes something like, assign a violation for a final E that is parsed into a foot. Um, for the parochial constraints, I have antipenult E, which basically says assign a violation to every E final form that does not have antipenultimate main stress. So this constraint is really just saying, I want a particular structure. If you're E final, you should have antipenultimate stress, and it will assign a violation to everything that's not that. Um, so it's a little bit different. It's completely different than other stress constraints. It doesn't say anything um, about the edge of the word. I mean, I guess it does in the sense that antipenultimate is defined as in terms of the edge of the word, um, but it's kind of picking out a specific syllable instead of saying get as close as possible, which is what normally constraints do. Okay, um, so how do these two uh, work in our analysis? So here's the tableau, it's exactly the same as the one before, but now it has non-finality E in it. So I've just added this constraint. You can see the weights are different. Um, a line right now is a weight of zero. Uh, this actually happened because I got these weights by fitting um, 
fitting the weights to the lexicon of English, so that data from the CMU pronouncing dictionary. Um, and for some reason, the learning algorithm gave a line right a weight of zero. So um, that's probably because, probably because I didn't give it um, like really long words. I'm not quite sure. But anyway, that's, that's what it's doing. Um, so the crucial thing to notice here is that um, non okay, yeah, so non-finality E gets a pretty decent weight. Um, so it, it does matter. It's doing work. Um, this whole system makes pretty good predictions for light penult words. So uh, when the word is just light, 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 um, it predicts 70% end of penultimate stress. When it ends in E, it predicts 95%. Um, so in the lexicon, we saw 93. So this is a pretty good prediction. For uh, heavy penult words, it predicts no difference between uh, E final and non E final. So you can see that here. The probabilities assigned to uh, LHL when it's not E final is like 99% um, penultimate stress. Um, and when it is E final, still 99% penultimate stress. Um, so the reason for that is that um, there's no way, uh, like th this form, this penultimately stressed form here, satisfies non finality E. So there's no. Um, there's nothing the constraint can really do to get stress to become antipenultimate, right? So it doesn't have that effect. It does have that effect for the all light words. It does not have that effect for the uh, heavy penult words. Uh, okay, so now let's consider antipenult E. This is the parochial constraint. Um, so as before, these weights are fitted to the lexicon. Um, it has a similar weight actually to non-finality E, which I guess kind of makes sense because it's doing about the same amount of work. Um, but it makes a little bit different predictions for the heavy penult words. Um, so it actually makes really similar predictions for the light penult words. So I've got those highlighted here. We got 70% um, when the uh, word does not end in E and we have 95% when it does um, and penultimate stress here. Um, but for the heavy penult words, it does predict a difference. Um, so this form, this LHL E final form actually does violate antipenult E. Um, so it has a little bit of a lower probability, not, not a huge amount different, um, but like 10 percentage points. So antipenult E predicts a difference between, uh, basically predicts that the final vowel should matter for the heavy penult forms. Um, just as it does for the light penal forms, whereas non-finality E uh, doesn't predict that difference. Okay, so testing productivity. Um, so I have two experiments. I'm just going to go through them actually quite quickly because I think they're relatively straightforward. They're just work tests. Um, but to sort of summarize before I do that, um, so the first experiment is just going to test, is that final E generalization even productive? The second experiment um, is going to basically address the issue of whether non-finality E or antipenal E is a better analysis. Um, and it's going to do that by testing both uh, the final vowel and the weight of the penal in the same experiment. So participants will be exposed to those final E heavy penal forms um, that they didn't see in the lexicon, um, and we'll see what they do with them, whether they choose, whether they have chosen a constraint cloning analysis or a parochial constraint analysis. Okay. So uh, here's the experimental method. Um, the way I did this was I basically tried to give uh, participants stress neutral um, nonce words. So they heard them, but they didn't have a stress pattern. So they were kind of these disembodied syllables, like independent syllables with their own um, kind of prosodic contour. Um, They're normalized for duration, vowel quality, the pitch contour, and the intensity. Um, and participants were instructed to say the word fluently as if it were a real word of English. So they would hear something like um, be, ve, da, and they would say something like bevetta. Um, so they were recorded, this is done on Mechanical Turk. They were recorded and then they were given two options. So for bevetta, maybe they were given bevetta and bevetta, so the antipenal and the penal option, and they just chose between them. So they're kind of transcribing themselves. Um, so Really all this is, is they were given a wug word without a stress pattern, they had to pick a stress pattern for it, and they saw final schwas and final ease. Um, and this is the result. So on the right, you see data from the experiment. On the left, you see data from the lexicon. Um, the take home here is really that um, the final vowel mattered. So they produced uh, more antipenultimate stress when the final vowel was e than when it was schwa. Um, this is a good match to the lexicon, though not perfect. Um, but there's definitely effect of final E. Um, you can see the coefficient of p-value from my logistic regression on the right over here. Um, so in conclusion, the final E generalization does seem to be productive. 
Um, okay, so now let's see what happens when we add heavy penalts into the mix. Um, so the methods are exactly the same as experiment one, except for there's an addition of a heavy penult condition. So some of the forms now have, I've highlighted them in blue here, some of them now have a heavy penult. These were all um, final consonants. There were no long vowels in the study, um, but I think that's going to be okay. Um, so now they would hear something like ra, maf, ka, and they would have to say something like ramifka or ramafka. Um, so now they have final E, final schwa, heavy and light, and those are all counterbalanced. So they have all, um, all four types of codes. Okay, um, and here's what those results look like. Um, so on the left, we have the heavy penal items, and on the right, we have the light penal ones. Um, basically, you can see the light penal items look exactly the same as the items in experiment one, which is encouraging. Um, but if we look at the heavy penalt cases, so remember this E final heavy penalt column here is something they don't really see in the lexicon. There were just 16 forms in CMU that fit this uh, kind of description, um, which isn't really a lot of data. Um, but it turns out that for these forms, they mostly give penultimate stress, but they do give them more antipenultimate stress than their schwa final counterparts. Um, so, uh, Basically, what this means is that the E final uh, generalization, final E generalization, um, applies equally to heavy penal words and to light penal words. Um, so, remember when we were talking about well, here we go. Yes. So when we were talking about um, the two analyses, the parochial constraint analysis with antipenal E, um, and the constraint cloning analysis with non-finality E. Um, Non-finality E predicted that there would not be an effect of final E on the heavy penal items, but in fact there is, and that is predicted by the parochial constraint. Um, okay, so to kind of wrap up here, um, this unnatural, typologically atypical final E generalization does appear to be productive. Um, furthermore, it interacts with the Latin stress rule in a way that is only consistent with uh, the parochial constraints hypothesis, not consistent with the constraint cloning hypothesis, at least as I've implemented them here. Um, so I think this is evidence that maybe learners, when they have to add a constraint to their grammar, they do so in a very sort of like targeted parochial way, um, and they don't necessarily do constraint cloning, which is, seems like it should maybe be easier than coming up with a whole new constraint. Um, but at least in this case, they definitely don't seem to be doing that. Um, okay, so to conclude, um, the strategy here was to investigate the learning process um, by looking at behaviors on forms for which there is little or no evidence in the lexicon. So that was those final E um, heavy penal forms. Um, introducing new constraints to account for crazy patterns is not always straightforward, it turns out. Um, so sometimes it is pretty straightforward, um, but in this case, it really wasn't. Um, not every constraint that you know, one could think of could account for uh, participants' behavior in this case. Um, so I compared this antipenal E constraint to a cloned version of non-finality, and antipenal E came out on top. Um, so questions for the future um, that I have include, you know, when do children create new constraints instead of using universal ones? I think this is probably a case where people have created a new constraint, um, but maybe in other cases they don't um, when there is you know, data they could use a new constraint for. Um, is cloning ever used? Maybe in some other patterns we do find evidence for constraint cloning. Um, a really interesting question is if people really are, you know, using these parochial constraints to account for um, crazy patterns in their language, unnatural patterns, um, how do they form them? Like, what's the process like to come up with a constraint like antipenal E? And finally, what else can we learn about constraint induction uh, using the strategy of um, looking for sort of gaps in the lexicon and uh, seeing what people do uh, with those caps. Um, okay, so thank you. Um, I welcome your questions. And uh, just to sort of point out, if anyone um, wants to ask me a question later, or if you're watching this video later on YouTube, um, feel free to go to my website, um, find my email address, and email me. I welcome questions by email as well. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Uh... So if you have any questions, uh, please uh, send me your name and uh, your affiliation to this, uh, to me. So let's see. So the first question uh, is from Andrew Lamont, University of Massachusetts, Am Amherst. Hey, Claire. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. This is a really cool talk. Um, 
I was wondering, could you go back to, uh, you have the graph with all the final unstressed vowels that service in English with some frequency? Yeah. Would you like this one where it's split by weight or just the general one? I mean, either. So, I, and then the, the things that got excluded are things like ooh, and I'm just curious, what other, what other vowels show up there? Um, I mean, all the vowels, I think, show up in final position mm. sometimes, um, but the long vowels are always stressed when they do, except for the vowel O, um, which can, for some reason, be final and stressless, despite the fact that it's a diphthong, um, but there's only a few cases of it in CMU. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I was just thinking, um, I, I mean, something like this is relevant to what I'm working on at the moment, but... Um, if you look at something like uh, uh, DeLacy uh, has a set of uh, constraints on vowels that should not appear as in the non-head position of a foot. So that would basically get you the do not foot uh, E if it's final, but it, it would be, I guess, more targeted to something that, that that's, I, I guess, less parochial in that mm -hmm. sense. And then if, if it's just the case that because you would expect that to generalize uh, up the sonority scale, but if, if it's the case that things that are more sonorous uh, just by happenstance don't appear in that position in English, all right, then the other cases you get are, are exceptions and the generalization is just, I don't know, final vowels don't like to be footed maybe or, or anything mm -hmm. more sonorous than E, something along those lines. That might be something mm -hmm. to look at. Yeah, so this would, uh, th that's actually really interesting. So. Uh, in this case, then, what would be going on is that the final, uh, so if there's a constraint that like E, or maybe if it's something about sonority and E happens to be at least one of the less sonor cells, um, E doesn't like to be in the dependent position of a foot. So then mm -hmm. that would mean, go to a, I can go to a tableau here. So then you, you, your choices are you can either do anti-penultimate stress and avoid it, you could do final stress, which I, I don't think we have, or you could get uh, penultimate stress, and then you have this this uh, this uh, bad foot dependent. Yeah, so I think this would basically amount to the same pattern as non-finality E mm -hmm. uh, here. So I think something that says don't have E be a dependent would not be violated by this form here. Um, oh, right. So I think that would, I mean, I'm definitely going to check into this, but I think that would wind up being inconsistent with the actual behavior on the lower test. Um, oh, okay. But yeah, that's an analysis I hadn't uh, actually heard of before, so thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, next question is from uh, Shigeto Kawahara, KYO University. I have one general question and one specific question. The general question is, to the extent that cloning is an option, then mm -hmm. how do kids decide between these two strategies? Yeah. Um, so I only have one experiment, or well, one <laughs> pattern. Um, in this case, it seems like they decided on, on the parochial analysis and it's interesting that them. every English speaker chose that strategy, right? So to um, the extent that there are two available options, it wouldn't be surprising if two different groups of people choose different strategy. Yeah, so actually that's a really good point. So um, what I can say is that um, it's hard to tell how much consistency there is across participants in the study because it was on mechanical turf. Each person only saw a few items in each condition. Mm -hmm. um, okay. But in general, I did see, um, I can't, it's just too few items for me to check just the heavy penults, um, but I did see that every single participant produced more antipenultimate stress on E final than schwa final. So I don't, that, that's not really answering your question, but it's kind of heading in the direction of the consistency across participants. Um, but yeah, that would definitely be something that's in, that would be interesting to check. Do some people just no. always just, um, do some people look like they have clone cloning and some people look like they have a parochial constraint? Yeah, that'd be cool. <laughs> but yeah, this is reminding me of this 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 proposal that it, it's in syntactic acquisition, but there's this proposal that says when UG 
has two options and when the data is not available to decide between these two options then kids can do either way and that can show up as a difference in the adult grammar mm -hmm. uh, doing a Mussolino student she's Korean I, I can try to find a reference but okay. that's something yeah some connection that's that that's that's interesting to look at maybe cool and thanks yeah, while we are on this slide, um, did you allow a line right to bear a negative weight? I did not. You did not, okay. So it may, turn out that, yeah. it may turn out that it may get a negative weight. Uh, yeah, that's likely. Yeah, with this data, if I were to give it like all the words of English, mm -hmm. um, I was only giving it these kind of like abstract patterns, right? So it just saw like LLL, LHL, or whatever as input. It didn't see individual words. So if it had longer words, then maybe it would know to give some weight to a line, right? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question is from Michael Kensovich from MIT. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, ah, yes, okay, so I'm not familiar with the CMU uh, the database. I'm curious um, how the final E words were counted. In particular then, were words ending in itty or ori or ari, they counted just once? Um, so I counted both ways. I think the picture, let me see. The picture you see here, where is it? There is, um, I think, a combination of all words. So I used a version of CM. Yeah. So, so in answer to your question, no, they were counted. So like opacity was counted, and also like tenacity was counted. Um, but if you isn't that going to bias the the <laughs> the results in a, a very particular way? You know, depending on what the consonant is. Yeah, so it will. Um, if you strip off all the forms that are morphologically complex, um, this, what you find is basically like, this bar gets moved up to like here. So it's, there's still a pretty strong final E generalization, um, but it's not quite as strong as if you include the morphologically complex forms. The other thing well, I will I'm, say. I'm sorry, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not understanding. So the the words ending in itty then, you know, there must be hundreds of them, right? There are, but there's a lot more um, ones that don't, I guess. <laughs> yeah, so it, this, this generalization is also true of the monomorphemes is basically what I'm trying to say. It's not quite as strong, but it's still pretty strong. Okay, so the, the, the graph then is showing what, 799 words ending in E. Mm -hmm. And so we're saying that itty and ori and ari then are in that set? Yep. Okay, so, and they're counted as each one being separate. That's not, right. Okay. Yeah, so opacity is one, antiquary is, well, antiquary is not in here because it has pre antiquated ultimate stress, but. Um. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. So uh, here's the, I understand why this is maybe not the best approach, um, but here's my defense. So um, it does seem like this e final generalization is productive. If it was just statistically true because of itty, then it shouldn't be productive, right? Um, I think this graph looks like what children hear. They don't hear itty. They hear, they don't know the morphology yet when they're learning the stress pattern in English. All right, um, that's the way you want to look at the data. Fine. So once again, it's still there if you take off all those forms as well. I did check this. <laughs> okay. All right, I'm finished, thank you. 
Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, any other question? Probably we can continue uh, the discussion after wrapping up the session. Thank you, Claire, uh, one more time. Uh, we'll first wrap up the session and uh, today's event and then continue the discussion for a few more minutes afterwards. So the uh, speakers will stay. Uh, so please uh, do that. Uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, Migiwa who organized it and also uh, Michinori Suzuki who joined uh, uh, the organization today. And uh, this event was supported by the Institute of Cultural and Linguistic Studies at KU University. Thank you for the uh, financial support and the Linguistic Lab at International Christian University. Uh, the last part of season one uh, of the KU and International Christian University Linguistic Colloquium will be held on July 29th, uh, two weeks from now, uh, uh, Japan time. And uh, on that day, Ji Sun Kim from University of Michigan and Sang Im Lee Kim from National, Univers uh, National Chautong University in Taiwan uh, will deliver that talk. If you have already registered for this series, uh, you will not need a uh, separate registration, but you will uh, uh, receive uh, a Zoom invitation, a Zoom registration form for that. Thank you all who participated in today's colloquium and thank you for the two speakers and uh, see you on July 29th. Uh, uh, if you don't have further questions, you may leave and the recording will start soon.